The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Thank you for joining us again in our study of 1 John. Let me reread the first four verses of that epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. John had been through all kinds of persecution by the time he wrote this. He had lived to see Jerusalem destroyed by the Roman armies. He'd escaped prior to the time of the destruction of Rome. He knew that everything he'd loved in Jerusalem as a boy was now gone. He wasn't raised in Jerusalem, but as a Jewish male, he would have been there three times a year and would have come to love the city of Jerusalem. It was all changed now. He knew that the temple had been burnt to the ground. He realized the fact that the emperor Titus had carried away the sacred table of the Lord and carried away the golden candlestick to Rome. He knew that over a million of his fellow Jews had been slain and the valley of the sons of Hinnom heaped full of their dead bodies until you could walk from one mountainside to the other on the bodies of Jewish corpses. He knew that 50,000 Jews had been sold into slavery in Egypt until by and by the bidding got so low that Jews were selling for 50 cents apiece. He knew that 80,000 of them had been sold into the Roman area as captives, and he knew that about 30,000 of them had died building the Roman Colosseum going down beneath the onslaught of Roman brutality. He knew all of this, and the Apostle John may have wondered why it was that God had kept him alive for so long. But God had preserved John in order to save the churches from one of the most insidious involvements we've ever had in Christianity. At the time that John wrote, the church had already largely passed through the problems that it had faced with Judaism. The church has now moved out into the Greek world and has come face to face with Greek philosophy. And in our previous video, we talked a little bit about the problems related to Gnosticism. John over and over again is answering these people who were believers in this incipient form of Gnosticism, which was starting to get to the place where it was coming full blown. So he starts out by saying, that which is from the beginning, and he's talking about the word. This is similar to the way he starts his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now he talks about that same Word, that which is from the beginning. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed, and he never will change. His permanence is certain. This is a direct shot at the heretics and their new truth. When it comes to religion, new is wrong. That's a rule of thumb we can always go by. In religion, new is wrong. Heretics always have some new elevated knowledge that the hoi polloi don't have. There's always another Book of Mormon. There's always a new pearl of great price. But John is talking about that which is from the beginning a timeless and eternal message. He's earnestly contending for the once for all delivered to the saints faith. There never will be another faith given. The faith was given once for all, never to be repeated. The rule of thumb is, if it's new, it's wrong. Paul said to the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed. They ought not to have been removed from what they had known from the beginning of their Christian walk. That which was from the beginning is permanent. Secondly, in addition to being permanent, that which is from the beginning is sensible. Sensible in the sense of being perceived by the senses. The Christian faith was not cast in a mystical paradigm or through some ethereal imagination. 
We don't have a super duper history. There was actually a theologian years ago who used that expression to talk about religious history. He called it super duper history. We don't have a super duper history that's different from the real history of what actually happened. The faith is not reserved for just the people in the know with supposed elevated and transcendent knowledge. The word of God is available to the senses. It was when, when John walked and talked with him. The word of God was available to the senses. What we have seen and heard proclaim we unto you. There is no secret gnosis that the Gnostics talked about. It just does not exist. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, I heard him, I saw him, I scrutinized him, I touched him. God became man. Don't let the heretics sway you away from that real incarnation. The eternal one entered time and was manifest. And there are four steps in John's sensible perception here. First, he says, we heard. They heard Jesus speak. This old man was there when he was young. He was there from the beginning of it to the end of it. He was there post-resurrection. For 40 days. We have heard, as constructed in the Greek language, indicates that the hearing was not confined to one single occasion. Rather, we have heard in a progressive, continuous, complete sense. We were there for that complete hearing. John is saying, I heard the Sermon on the Mount. I heard the parables. I didn't miss any of it. The Spirit brings all things to my remembrance now from 60 years ago. So I've got it all. He says, we have seen with our eyes. This is a very interesting way of putting it. Usually if I say I've seen you, I don't say I saw you with my eyes. That's kind of taken for granted. John is talking here, though, emphatically about the physical act of seeing. There's nothing mystical about it, and that's his point. He's not saying, I had a vision, I saw a phantom appearance of the mystical Logos. This is not docetic double talk. We have seen with our eyes, I believe he adds with our eyes, so that everybody knows that he's not talking about some transcendental visionary kind of second sight. He's talking about physical sight, just as the camera and I are seeing each other right now. It's that same kind of sight he's talking about, physical sight. And again, it's in the perfect tense for complete seeing. John was there when Jesus cast out demons, and he saw the results of that. He was there when the lame were healed. He was there when Jesus touched the coffin of the young man. He was there when Jesus walked on the water and multiplied the loaves and fishes. John was there and saw it all. People today tell me they saw the Lord, and I don't put any confidence in that at all. I hear all kinds of stories about who saw Jesus where. But the apostles were there and saw, them, saw him with their eyes. He says, we beheld, which is beyond just seeing with our eyes, or he wouldn't have mentioned it separately. We beheld. This means to look long at. It's talking about a searching gaze. It's talking about putting the Lord through the laboratory of human investigation, which the apostles did over time. We looked closely at this word. We looked deeply into it. Same word used in John 1.14. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We looked closely at it and we were experiencing all of it. I heard the man, I saw the man, I saw the meaning. I saw that this was God in human flesh. Then he says, our hands handled. This expression literally means to grope, to feel after, like a blind man would feel after something. A blind man takes a page of Braille and the smallest little bumps and bends that he feels in that paper translate into meaning in his mind. Jesus used this same expression in Luke 24, verse 39, when he said, handle me, handle me and realize that a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see me have. He told Thomas, reach hither and touch my side. 
John says this was no apparition, this was no phantom. John even leaned on his chest at the Last Supper. He had three years to touch Jesus. And notice that John does not just say, I have heard, I have seen, I beheld, my hands handled. No, he says we, and he says our, because he's including himself along with the other apostles of the original 12. We were all there. We all heard and saw and looked intently into and handled the word of life. God was hidden until Jesus Christ became visible. The word was with God and the word was God and in him was life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. John is certain about the permanence of the word of life. And he's certain about the sensibility of the word of life. Also, John is certain about proclaiming the word of life. That old message that I personally experienced, now I am called to proclaim, he says. This was important because the people to whom John was writing had never seen Jesus. The original readers of this letter were in Asia Minor. Jesus never went to Asia Minor. They were not witnesses of Christ in that sense. John is credible because everybody knows that he was with Jesus. Christ manifested himself to the apostles to qualify them as firsthand eyewitnesses so they could then pass that on to others. And when it was received by others, it would again be passed on to the next generation. You and I cannot be apostles. There's nothing that you and I could possibly do to ever qualify for that role. But we have the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. John said it is certain that this is the true message. He's also certain about the fellowship or the partnership, the koinonia, which is often translated as fellowship. It's a joint participation held in common. And it's more than just socializing. A lot of times today, the expression fellowship is used sort of synonymously with socializing. But John is not saying, I want you to have social interaction with me. How am I going to have social interaction with John? He's gone. He was gone long before I ever got here. What John's talking about is a real partnership, a sharing of life. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit said Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, he said in the Galatian letter. The partnership is so intimate that you become the temple of God, the place where Christ dwells. John says that old gospel message is the message that I preach. I was there. We heard, we saw, we studied, we handled that truth. We're partakers of the divine nature. We're sharing the life of the triunity. This is the same life that someday is going to bring us up out of the grave. These things I write unto you that your joy may be complete or full, he says in verse 4. So we have a certain message, a certain witness proclaiming a certain gospel, which brings a certain fellowship and then produces a certain joy. There's nothing like hearing it from an eyewitness. The veracity of this epistle was settled millennia ago. And our lives should be built on the same certainties that he's talking about here. 1 John is a certain word for an uncertain age. And the first four verses deal with the certainty of the incarnation. Now the next section, I'd like to read from verse 5 of chapter 1. On down through chapter 2, verse 1. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
This section that I have just read deals with the certainty of sin. The certainty of sin needed the incarnate one to come and be the sin bearer. John is protecting the faithful from error by rehearsing the truth and reiterating the truth. For John, everything is about the truth. In his third epistle, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. But anybody who's passionate for the truth is also passionately set against error. When we lose our will to discern, when we no longer distinguish true from false, then we lose our clarity and we lose our conviction. The Apostle John wants us to understand sin. We cannot understand forgiveness if we don't understand sin. We in Christ readily confess our sin, and we do this as a pattern of life. Joshua told Achan back in the Old Testament, Glorify God and confess your sin. Joshua chapter 7, verse 19. One of the ways we glorify God is by confessing our sin. If Achan had not confessed and God killed him because God knew he'd sinned, then people could have questioned the justice of God. But when Achan confessed, then God's holiness was justified even in human eyes as being too pure to look upon iniquity. Confess your sin, Achan, so that when God acts in divine justice against you, God is not dishonored. Confessing sin is the noble thing to do. But as human beings, we usually don't like to do it very well. The false teachers of whom John is speaking not only have a wrong doctrine about Christ, but they have a wrong doctrine about themselves. One man told me, well, I shouldn't have to apologize for it. Yes, but why don't you want to apologize for it? They develop complicated philosophical and religious systems to remove the necessity of confessing their sins. People get to the place where they will even deny that sin exists and then live as though it does not exist. There's a constant effort to escape the reality of sin. People want anything but a biblical diagnosis of sin. The book of Malachi is filled with this because it was true in Malachi's day as well. How did we despise your name? What did we do wrong? We didn't do anything wrong. Where is the God of justice? This isn't fair. We brought our sacrifices just like we were supposed to, and on and on. God is serious about people who don't acknowledge their sins. People think God is unjust to send people to hell. And this is often because they will not recognize sin for what it actually is. When you confess your sin, you say, God, hell is what I deserve. Anybody who will not confess their sin cannot be a Christian. If you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar because God says you have. You're calling God a liar because God says you have. The starting point in understanding sin is looking at the nature of God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 5. God tucked Moses into the cleft of a rock and allowed a portion of his glory to pass by. The glory that Moses saw was some kind of light. His face shone with the reflection of that light. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was transfigured as shining light. God dwells in unapproachable light. Christ is the light of the world. His is the kingdom of light. We shine as lights in the world. You used to be darkness, says Paul to the Ephesians, but now you are light. God has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Ye are the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light. There's no other source of life than God and all that lives received life from him. John the Baptist was not the light. That's made very clear in the Gospel of John. He came that he might bear witness of the light. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. But he who practices truth comes to the light. Light is associated with truth and virtue. 
Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 130. The unfolding of thy words gives light. The two great properties of the light which is life are truth and holiness. If you are a possessor of the light, you are devoted to the truth and to righteousness. The manifestation of the life in you will be your commitment to truth and righteousness. The life of God cannot be divorced from the truth. We fall short of being like God because the life he has given us is incarcerated in our flesh. But the evidence of his life in us is manifest in our devotion to the truth and to holiness. If you don't have God's hatred of sin, you really need to develop God's hatred of sin. If you're reluctant to confess sin, then you're not seeing sin for what it is. We need to render the same verdict on sin that God does and see it the way that God sees it. Our willingness to confess sin helps to demonstrate our attitude towards sin. We long for the day when we enter the full light of eternal glory, where the longing for pure truth and pure virtue will be forever fulfilled. But until then, it's the pursuit of our hearts to know the truth and to live in it obediently and in a holy manner. When you confess and forsake your sin, God grants mercy. The practice of concealing personal sin becomes a refined art form among the people of the world. People learn to excuse themselves. They learn to blame anything but themselves. But Christians are people who confess. Christians are open and honest before God about their iniquities. God has built into us a conscience with a very important function. And rightly educated, that conscience causes you to feel bad about your sin. This is a benevolent gift from God because it slows down your own self-destruction. The conscience slows your pace of iniquity. To be constantly shouted at by your wounded conscience helps to retard the speed with which you plunge into destruction. David said one time, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all the day long. God, your hand was heavy upon me, he said. My vitality, my life juices drained away as with the fervent heat of summer. But finally David confessed and God forgave. The person who covers his sin heaps upon himself a severe and painful burden. The person who covers his sin in this life will have it uncovered in the next life. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. Nothing is hidden that will not be made known. What you've said in the dark will be heard in the light. What you've whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. There's a full record of your sinful life written down in what the book of Revelation calls books, an infallible and unrelenting record. And there are no secrets God will, in the end, judge all sin because all sin is committed against God. David sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. He sinned against his baby. He sinned against other people, including himself and his family and the whole nation. But to God, David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Because the ultimate heinousness of all sin is that it's against God who alone is absolutely holy and who is always offended by every sin. True confession is not just admitting that I sinned against somebody else. It's admitting that all sin is primarily against God. Uncovering sin to that degree brings a person to true repentance and toward the prosperity of the soul. All sinners have a choice to cover up or to confess. John shows us that people who belong to God confess. The word confess is homo legeo. Logeo means to say, and homo means the same. So homo legeo means to say the same thing. In other words, to say the same thing that God is saying. 
If you confess Christ, you're saying the same thing about Christ that God says about Christ. If you confess sin, you're saying the same thing about sin that God says about sin. Influencing the churches of Asia Minor were teachers who were saying different things about Christ and different things about sin. And John is setting it all straight here. He uses the word we in verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 of chapter 1. Five verses in a row he uses the word we because he is stating truth that's applicable to everyone. But in verses 6, 8, and 10, he describes those who only claim to be in the fellowship. If we say, if we say, if we say. But it's not what you say, it's what you are. That's what John cares about. In verses 7 and 9, he describes those who really are in the fellowship. Describing those who only claim to be in the fellowship, in verse 6, he uses the word darkness. In verse 8, he uses the idea of deceit. And in verse 10, he uses the idea of defamation. Darkness, deceit, and defamation. That's what you're left with if you deny sin. If you feel prone to hide your sin, that's evidence of how dark the darkness is, how deep the deception is, and how severe the defamation of God is. Now, you can hide it in a gracious way, seemingly to the rest of the world, but it is not a gracious reality. To have the boldness to call God a liar is unimaginable. David said when he confessed his sin, he was liberated. And we get liberated too when we confess our sin. Christians are by nature repenters. For us, repentance is a way of life. Confessing sin is habitual. When we mess up, we own up. And this really is a huge difference I see between the mature in Christ and those who are out of Christ or those who are stunted by pride. Covering sin, denying sin, trivializing sin, diminishing sin, characterizes non-Christians and the non-Christ-like. We hope you'll join us for our next video.